Hi everyone. I wanted to talk a little bit about the shofar because we're coming up on the high holidays and shofar is one of the mystery things that still goes on in Judaism. Um, it dates back to the Bible. We have mention of it in the Torah and the Bible and it's it's always a little mysterious because we're we're making a sound through a part of an animal when you think about it and that is very strange. Um, one of the places where we hear about shofar is at the revelation of Sinai, um, when it says that uh, Israel can hear shofar blasts and shofar some some sounds from the shofar coming from Mount Sinai, but there's no one on Mount Sinai, so who is making that noise? Um, you know, the wind blowing through the horns of animals, or it's a mystery. It's a mystery. And what it invokes in us is also quite mysterious. And so I wanted to spend a bit of time. We know a lot of the legalities of shofar. We know that, you know, it, we can take a shofar from, um, it has to come from an animal. It can come from the bovine family, but it can't be a cow's horns because cow's horns are keratin, not bone. And it has to be bone and it can't be antlers because antlers can't be hollowed out. And on and on and on and on. Is it curved? Is it bent? Is it straight? Is it, you know, all of the, the technical side of it. Uh, not blowing it on Shabbat because you'd have to carry it to blow it on Shabbat. We, we have reams of information about the technical side. But when we start to talk about what does it do for us? What does it invoke within us? What are we supposed to be thinking about? What is it supposed to be awakening within us? Where are we supposed to be made, motivated toward? That's where we start to get into the beauty of the shofar, the complexities of the shofar. So the first thing is that we would connect it in our minds to the binding of Isaac, because that's the first place where the text points us to that part of an animal and says that when God stopped Abraham from sacrificing his son, there was an animal, a ram, caught by its horns in a thicket right there. And that's where Avram takes the animal and sacrifices the animal instead of his son. And it teaches us an enormous amount at that point. It teaches us about substitution. It teaches us never to put our children on an altar for us. It teaches us, certainly in the name of religion, never to sacrifice our children. And, um, you know, the, this whole idea of martyrdom that we may actually be inclined toward that, but the, the text is stopping us and saying, you don't do that. Um, this idea of communicating with with God through animals, through the natural world, where in the ancient time it was through animals and sacrificing and killing animals. In today's world, one might argue it's not through killing the animals, but we still do communicate through God through nature. We still um, look around, at least covenantally, of course, we would look around at the harvest and say, is covenant working? Well, let's take a look at the rain. Let's take a look at the harvest. We would find out. So this ongoing communication through nature begins with the idea of the ram's horns. It begins with that idea of the shofar. So our mind goes there immediately. It also, for the high holidays, reminds us that Abraham was saying to God, find another way. If you need to test me, if we need to push this relationship to its limits, please stay away from my children. Let's find another way. And it's successful. And that's what we do on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. With the shofar blast, we're reminding God that God can ask things of us that we won't survive, that we won't make it through. It's too much of a test. It'll break our humanity. Please find another way. So that's one of the first symbols of the shofar. And to awaken that within us, to awaken that idea that we really can and must stand up as a partner with God and plead our case and get over our humility and get over the sense of who am I to be saying this to God? And remember, we are the descendants of, of ultimately Adam and Eve. We, we definitely have to stand up and, and plead our case as, as did Adam and Eve. So we have all of that information that we know our mind goes to when it comes to the shofar. The other thing that we know was going on in the ancient world is that the shofar was used in a practical way. It was used to declare war, um, which the state of Israel today, the modern state of Israel, still uses in a symbolic way. So it's not that we would blow shofars and the whole country of Israel now knows Israel is at war. The army has its own mechanisms of figuring out how to communicate to the country that it's at war. But we do have many images of, of um, Israelis blowing shofars before the tanks 
as they head out to war because we are ancient Israel. We are connected. We are links in a chain. Modern Israel is not uh, a new entity of a political reality, but draws its, its lines and its threads directly back to the ancient world. This is how we went to war. This is how we still awaken ourselves and remind ourselves, how does a Jewish person go to war? What are the rules of war? What is the humanity that enters into the, the rules of engagement. And all of that gets reminded on a spiritual level before we engage in the battle, before we go to war. So the shofar in that regard is still very important to us. And I think there's one area that is also something we need to be paying attention to in the details of the shofar, to think about this when we're hearing the sounds in the synagogue. The shofar itself is not holy. The shofar itself is an animal horn. It's to be treated the same way we treat animals in general. We have laws in Judaism about humane treatment of animals and what do we do with animal body parts to respect the fact that there was life within this. It's, it's no more holy than any other part of the animal. But what we are producing is holy. The sounds that are coming from the shofar, that is holy. The commandment is to hear the shofar, not to touch it, not to blow it, not to interact with it, to hear it, because it's the product that becomes holy. That, I think, is a detail we miss. And that is so important for the messaging of Rosh Hashanah as we go through the year to remember that it's what we produce that we need to be looking at rather than only what, well, you know, I meant well, I, it ended up disastrous. I might have really hurt someone. I might have really created a terrible trauma in someone's life, but hey, I meant well. Well, we want to look at that and say, I'm glad that we meant well, but how do we now repair that? Because it didn't produce what we wanted to produce. I have to look at that and I, I have to hold myself accountable to that. It's the product that I'm, I'm connecting with. That's where the holiness is. So that's an aspect of the shofar. It's a, a subtle detail that I think oftentimes get lost. And one of the most powerful statements of the shofar is the number of times that we're going to, to blow the shofar um, over the course of the high holidays. And the rabbis tell us that we have to be hearing the shofar sounds 100 times. And of course, then the question is, why 100? I mean, this is beautiful rabbinic style. First tell me it's 100, then ask why 100. And I'm right in there with you. I want to know why. And the rabbis in the Talmud say, because that's the number of cries that the mother of Sisera cried when she was worried about her son. And now I'm intrigued because the story of Sisera is the story of an enemy. It's not the story of an Israelite. It's the story that we find in the book of Judges, in the song of Deborah, in the story of Deborah, one of the first judges in the book, where we're told that Sisera is in fact an enemy general and he's declared war on Israel. And just to condense this story, um, it's an amazing story of Israel being ready for war with Deborah leading them and Barak is the general and Sisera and the tank, his, I'm sorry, his chariots, his iron chariots are in the valley engaging in war and Israel is always uh, the victim of this because they're not allowed to build chariots or, or any kind of um, uh, weaponry that involves iron. And God makes it flood in the valley and now all the chariots are bogged down. So Sisera gets down off his chariot and flees on foot and that's when he encounters Yael. And he comes into Yael's tent. And what's interesting is that the narrative of the, the story in Judges opens up questions because Yael, after inviting him in as an ally, we're told she's an ally, suddenly turns on him and tent pegs his head to the ground viciously. And we're reading that thinking, what did I miss? Because she was an ally. She's offering him refuge from the Israelite army that's chasing him. And suddenly she tent pegs him to the ground. And then when we go to the Song of Deborah, authored by a woman, we then get more details in the story of Yael. And it tells us that he actually is, is attempting to rape her. And she's defending herself. And therefore, he's trying to take advantage of, of her extending refuge to him. And she very viciously defends herself and kills him. 
And then the song immediately switches, and now it's Sisera's mother. And it says she's leaning out the window, and she's wondering, what's taking him so long? It shouldn't take this long to win a war. I'm, I'm worried. What's going on? And Deborah in the song goes on to tell us, well, her maidens, and she's comforting herself, saying, no, 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 don't worry. I'm sure he's just detaining himself, raping a woman here, molesting a woman there. It takes time. Just give him a, a bit of time. He'll come home. And you're shocked. This is how a mother is comforting herself? And of course, the irony is that's exactly what he was doing, and that's why he's dead. So you know that her comfort will end in grief. You know that she will be mourning her son. And how dare she comfort herself in such a merciless manner. The last thing we should be doing is commemorating the hundred cries of Sisera's mother that she's crying over her son. But then the text tells us, you see, for that reason, I want you to hear the shofar 101 times. Not just the hundred times of Sisera, the hundred and one time. That extra time to remind ourselves that every mother will mourn her child. It doesn't matter if they're an ally. It doesn't matter if they're an enemy. It doesn't matter who they are. Every mother will mourn her child. And whether we agree with them, or we disagree with them, or we're disgusted by their morality, or we're not, there's always the bottom common element that every mother will mourn her child. And we know with the shofar blast that Sarah, the Midrash tells us, when she thought that Abraham did, in fact, sacrifice Isaac on the mountain, she ran to the bottom of the mountain, screamed out to him, and then cried and sobbed and hyperventilated, and then had one last cry and died. And those are the cries of the shofar. The tkia, the long cry, the short broken up sobs, the hyperventilation, those short staccato notes, and ultimately tkia gedola, the long drawn out sob that was her last breath. And the Midrash and the Talmud is telling us that is what's at stake here. That's what we want the shofar to remind us and God that ultimately when it comes to destiny, when we stand there as parents, we want to remember and remind God, every parent, God forbid, they would mourn what happens to their child, that there have to be other ways to figure out our destiny, that God and us together have to figure out another strategy. And we can, because the shofar is reminding us that we can. How do we know that we can? Because Avram taught us that we did.